So if you don't watch my channel on a regular basis, it's been a while since I've uploaded my last video and that is because I recently moved to a different state. Unfortunately, uh, the home that I moved into is not what I expected because my landlord lied about a few things, actually a lot of things. And so now I have to move again in the next few weeks. So I'm gonna try to upload my next video within the next couple of weeks, but if I don't, that's because I am back at square one with the exception of being in the state that I planned to move to, but having to pack all my shit back up again just, just to, to put, put it, it back, back on the, the truck, truck and, and then, then take, take the, the shit off the truck. The truck. And, and putting, putting it, it into, into a, a new, new domicile, domicile is, is, is it's really, really frustrating. frustrating. Uh, just just to let you know, you know, in case in case some time goes by again. But anyway, that's enough about me and my personal issues. I wanted to talk about the United States involvement in protecting Nazi war criminals and bringing them to the United States for their own purposes, regardless of the fact that they are responsible for the deaths of millions of people. After the end of the war, Nazis were coming coming out of their disgusting slime covered hidey holes to flee to areas all over the world, including places in Italy, South America, Australia, Spain, Canada, and the US. And unbelievably, it was not very difficult them to seek refuge in the States. And what makes this whole situation even more frustrating is that at this time in history, which was right at the end of World War II, there were thousands of displaced Jews living in DP camps, also known as displaced person camps. And these camps were established in Germany, Austria, and Italy shortly after Allied troops liberated Jewish survivors from concentration camps. It's really crazy. They literally just went from one camp to another camp. While they weren't concentration camps, these weren't like retreats. These weren't vacation getaways. And while conditions could vary from camp to camp, some camps were more tolerable than other camps. And just to give you an overview of some of the issues that people had to face living in these DP camps, sometimes there was barely enough food for them to survive, poor to no medical treatment. And if you could believe it, some were forced to bunk with Nazis who just months prior tortured them and killed their family members. Just imagine having to sleep next to the man or woman who was responsible for the death of your mother, your, your daughter, your son, your cousin, your aunt, like just imagine it. And some of these survivors lived in these camps for several years and this resulted in what became known as the DP immigration crisis. But some survivors were able to get that golden immigration ticket where they were able to start a new life in places like Canada, the US, Israel, and South Africa. Meanwhile, the US was giving these golden immigration tickets to Nazi war criminals and some of them were actually pretty high up in the food chain. For example, high-ranking officials who were involved with the creation of the Jewish question. Oh, and by the way, because a lot of the names I'm going to be reciting to you are German, just wanted to give you guys a little disclaimer. If you haven't already seen my videos, I am really truly bad at pronouncing names and it's not for a lack of trying or trying to be disrespectful. Anyway, let's move on. And so these Nazi war criminals were actually allowed to enter the US as war refugees, while actual survivors, actual refugees were forced to live in these DP camps. While some Nazis were able to sneak their way into the US on their own, some were able to sneak in with the assistance of people within the CIA, senior military officials, and people from other various government organizations. And these Nazis who applied for visas to live in the United States, they were very vague about what they did did during the war and immigration they didn't really seem to care 
all that much. At least not enough to ask the right questions. For example, there was this guy named Jacob Reamer who was a Ukrainian that lived in Queens, New York, who also owned a restaurant. And he immigrated to the States in 1952. But what makes this man's immigration so interesting is the fact that he told immigration officials that he was a German prisoner of war who just worked some boring average office job. He left out the part where he was a decorated SS officer who raided Jewish villages and trained Nazi guards and he got in. And that's not to say that the US was the only lax country when it came to Nazi immigration. There were also some organizations who knowingly or unknowingly were involved in assisting Nazis in producing travel documents, like the Red Cross, for example. You heard right, the Red Cross helped Nazi war criminals there were also organizations that helped them escape, like the Vatican. I mean, me personally, there really is no surprise there. I don't know about you, but I, I was not surprised when I read that. Vatican officials were involved in creating this blasphemous version of the Underground Railroad that is now known as the Rat Line. These escape routes were created by church leaders to help Nazis flee to places in South America and other parts of the world where these murderers could peacefully live out the rest of their days. However, for the sake of time, I am only going to focus on the United States involvement with sheltering Nazi war criminals. So over time, it's estimated that about 10,000 Nazis were able to sneak their way into the United States. And this was amongst actual war refugees. And some of these assholes had the nerve to lie and say that they had suffered at the hands of the Third Reich during their immigration processing. Just disgusting. But if just a little bit more care was given, just a little bit more questioning, research, it would not have been very difficult for these immigration screeners to see through their lies. And this could be attributed to a combination of things, like a lack of training amongst immigration screeners, or just a lack of giving a shit. I mean, that that's always an option. But this wasn't always the case. Some of these immigration screeners, they caught wind of it. They knew what was going on, and it was obviously really disturbing to them. And so some of these employees, they complained about them letting Nazis into the United States to their superiors, but no one cared. It fell on deaf ears. And so these wolves in sheep's clothing were allowed to blend in in the United States as janitors, restaurant owners, or whatever business owner, factory workers, cooks, you name it. But there were also some Nazi criminals that the US government sought out for their own needs Initially, the US, they demonized the Nazis in the media. But as the war began to come to a close, they started to think about the future. That is their future enemy, the Soviet Union. And so to combat this concern, they started collecting Nazis like Beanie Babies. So why was the US so interested in gathering up all these Nazis and bringing them to the United States to the point where they were willing to completely overlook all of the atrocities they had committed against humanity. Well, the Nazis, they had experience fighting against the Soviets. If you're not familiar with World War II, during the war, the Soviets were actually the US's ally and they were Germany's enemy. And also the US, they were super impressed by what the Nazis were able to accomplish within such a short amount of time. And I personally hate to say this, but it's true. I, I, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like it's not. They, they created some amazing shit. Hate them, I, I really do, <laughs> but um, I mean, it's the truth. The Nazis had some of the world's most brilliant minds and unfortunately, instead of using their minds for good, they ended up using it for evil. And so knowing what they produced, the US, they were like, man, they gotta have some really amazing scientists behind them. Wow, we want in on that. We want tanks, we want amazing rockets. Yeah, let's do it, let's bring them over here. And of their creations, the most notable was the V2 rocket. The V stands for vengeance, by the way. How angsty is that? And what makes this rocket so special is that it was the first long range guided ballistic missile. 
and it was created to destroy all ally cities by the Nazis. And the person who created this missile was a man named Werner von Braun, who was one of the Nazi scientists who was brought to the US as part of Operation Paperclip. Oh wow, it's getting really dark in here. Ugh. Hold on, give me one second. And I'm pretty sure that the US by no means felt like they needed an excuse or reason to want to employ Nazis because they were gonna do whatever the hell they wanted to do. They rationalized this acquisition of Nazis by creating two categories. There were good Nazis and there were bad Nazis. I'm not kidding. There, there was a clear distinction between the two. And let me break down to you what that distinction actually was. It's stupid. Bad Nazis were the ones who had directly taken part in the atrocities of World War II that we're all familiar with. You know, the people who were at the concentration camps, the people who were involved in the Jewish question, the people who, you know, did all the, the things, right? And while the good or the moderate Nazis were the ones who weren't politically driven fanatics and murderers, these were mostly the people who, you know, they didn't shoot the gun, but they made the gun to shoot, if you know what I mean, that type of thing. And I think it's also important for me to note that while I was conducting research for this video, I came across these good Nazis claiming that, well, you know, I visited some concentration camps. I worked in environments where there were war prisoners who were abused, starved, and experimented on, but I, didn't see anything. I didn't see anything. I, I didn't see any of that shit. I don't know what the hell you talking about. And so the Nazis that fell into this category were just apolitical and intelligent individuals who were driven by their careers. So in summary, they did what they had to do. And these good Nazis, they also had experience fighting the Soviets. But in the end, all that good versus bad BS, it didn't matter because the US invited Nazis who were also directly involved with concentration camps. From 1945 to 1959, the US invited an estimated 1,400 to 1,600 Nazi scientists, doctors, chemists, engineers, you name it. And it was these events that became known as Operation Paperclip. Operation Paperclip was a top secret intelligence program that was signed off by then President Harry Truman in 1946. And the agencies involved in ensuring the successful immigration of these war criminals in Operation Paperclip was the Joint Intelligence Objectives Agency, which was an agency created for Operation Paperclip and agents under the then US Army's Counterintelligence Corps. And this top secret project was given the name Operation Paperclip because officers who were interested in recruiting a specific Nazi for whatever reason, they would attach a paperclip of their war record to their immigration document. Now thinking about all of the hell they wrought on so many people, these guys were invited to live the good life. They were housed, they were paid $6 a day, which based on the US Bureau of Labor Statistics Inflation Calculator, that equates to about $463.45 per five day work week, which is more than a lot of people make living in the US today. They were also given a lab with research assistance, and the US also brought over their family members. Shit, I would not be surprised if they were able to bring their goldfish. And going back to the whole good versus bad Nazi bullshit, Nazis being considered for living in the US could actually write a statement to help increase their chance of acceptance. They would literally write a page explaining to the US government why they were a good Nazi. And this actually worked. It worked. It worked for Werner von Braun, the Nazi scientist I mentioned previously. He would actually become the head of NASA. Oh, you didn't know that? Yeah, the head of NASA was a Nazi. Von Braun became a sought out prize by the US because he was responsible for the creation of that B-2 rocket. What's funny is that this man was originally considered a high security risk. That is until he wrote that moving good Nazi statement. And after that work, Von Braun was able to come to the US with his parents, 
his brother, and his new wife. Oh, and almost a hundred of his colleagues who worked with him on that rocket. They were all relocated to Fort Bliss in Texas. In 1932, Von Braun was offered a deal by the German army. And so I wanna go in a little bit on Von Braun's background because I think it's so interesting that this guy was able to go from Nazi criminal to head of NASA. And he's just one, he's just one of many that the US brought here to live. It's crazy, it's crazy. In 1932, Von Braun was offered a deal by the German army. In exchange for having their financial backing and obtaining his doctorate, Von Braun worked on top secret liquid propellant rocket science for them. And not long after, that was when Hitler came into power. And supposedly, per him, originally he wasn't an, a hardcore Nazi enthusiast. All he cared about was his research. But as he received more and more financial support for his rockets, that's when he decided he wanted to be more supportive of the Third Reich. It wasn't until 1937 that he was officially asked to join the Nazi party. And believing that if he didn't join, it would ruin his career, he accepted the position. Then in 1940, he was invited by the infamous Heinrich Himmler to become an SS officer. And he was advised by his military superior that if he declined this invitation, it would be very unwise. So he accepted, and over the next three years, he would rise in rank to major due to Himmler's fond appreciation for his work with rockets. Himmler was like his biggest fan. Himmler loved him some Von Braun. I find it interesting that everything in this man's life that ties him to Nazism was just him going through the motions, you know? just not really having a choice. There always seems to be an excuse for this guy. Anyway, by October 1942, the V-2 rocket had its first successful flight. And even though this new military technology was still in its infancy, Hitler approved production of them due to the war getting worse. But now the problem the Nazis faced was, how would they get the labor necessary to produce these rockets? All of their people were tied up in other places fighting the war. And so to resolve this issues, the Nazis, they said, well, wait a minute, we already have labor. Obviously, all our victims we've imprisoned in concentration camps, let's use them. So the Nazis founded a camp at Pindamendum where they brought prisoners to work on these rockets. But due to an Allied air raid on the camp in 1943, Hitler and Himmler made the decision to create a rocket manufacturing plant underground. And this led to the creation of two new camps, Middlework and Dora. And while Von Braun was not involved in the creation of these concentration camps or labor camps, his work was directly associated with it. They were necessary for him to do his work. And so he was in direct contact with these prisoners. And he was also responsible for how they were used. But Von Braun, he pled the fifth. He said he was privy to their poor living conditions, but he never saw anybody die, never saw not one dead person. And just to show you how full of shit this guy was, even though I'm, I'm pretty sure you're already aware of this, but I, I just wanna show evidence of it. Here's a picture of a woodcut created by concentration camp survivor, Dominic Cerny. This piece is aptly named Buried Alive. And in this woodcut, the artist depicted what he saw in this underground camp. And obviously we all know that living conditions in concentration camps were horrific. And unlike wars past, World War II is very interesting because for the first time, we're able to really get an inside look into what really transpired during this war. You know, we don't have actual images of how Genghis Khan conquered other people, but we do have still images of Hitler and the Nazis just devastating people's homes, murdering millions of people. This isn't something that, this isn't something that we can pretend didn't happen or argue about. I mean, there are people out there who are Holocaust deniers, not gonna get into that, <laughs> but we have evidence of it that people lived in these horrific environments. And so we know that the Holocaust exists that it happened and how it happened. So I refuse to believe this man's claims that he didn't see anything like that at a concentration camp. What's also interesting about Von Braun is that he likes to use this one instance where the Gestapo arrested him 
as evidence of his opposition to the Third Reich. He was arrested for a short time because he let it slip that he believed that they were losing the war. And so he was arrested for like a, a blink of, of time. That was his noble deed. Despite his disgusting background, this man became known as the father of space travel and rocket science. And while I won't deny the fact that the US benefited off the tech and talents of people like Von Braun, those advancements were made off the backs and lives of millions of people, innocent people, men, women, and children. But it's because of Von Braun that we landed on the moon. And this is the technology we are using today, Nazi technology. So this is only one example of a Nazi war criminal who was a big fish, not some just some regular smegular guy, like a guy who was really involved in the direct death of many people that the United States took in. So how did we find out about Operation Paperclip? Well, in 1985, a CNN investigative reporter named Linda Hunt revealed the story to the public after finding government files from federal archives containing information on Operation Paperclip. But what I find to be most interesting is that here we are in 2022, and a lot of people don't know about Operation Paperclip, which is why I decided to do this video. And if you knew about Operation Paperclip before seeing this video, that's great, you know, that's awesome. But a lot of people don't, to my surprise. And what else is interesting is that years later, the US started to deport Nazis hiding out in the US, and as recent as just the past few years. During Trump's administration, there was a 95-year-old ex-Nazi soldier who was deported back to Germany. This dude was living in Queens, New York for several years. And just like many others, he was able to just sneak his way into the US by lying about his identity to immigration. And ICE did not give a shit about this guy being 95. They scooped him right up and sent him back into Germany. And some people may feel like, well, why do all this? I mean, the guy is 95. He's an old man that's been living in the US for years now. He probably doesn't even know much about German culture anymore. It probably doesn't have anybody he knows that's alive in Germany now. And some people may feel like, you know what? That's just an excuse. Age is nothing but an excuse that does not excuse him from the horrible shit that he was involved in. Do you think that they should have just let him rot for the next, I don't know, six months he had to live left in his queen's apartment? Or should they have sent him packing? Or or should they have done worse? Should, should they have taken it a step further and sent his ass to jail? There is a lot more to Operation Paperclip than what I covered here today. I mean, I could go on and on and on about it, um, but I'm not going to because that would be a ridiculously long video and I'm not, I'm not doing that again. So if you wanna learn more about Operation Paperclip, I definitely recommend checking out these resources that I use for my research. They were fantastic. It's a very interesting topic. I definitely recommend digging into it if you if you haven't before. And I also want to say, while people like myself believe that the whole good versus bad Nazi crap is a bunch of bullshit and it's completely messed up, there are some people out there, I'm sure, who believe that there is a such thing as good and bad Nazis. But at the end of the day, the US government invited and paid people to come to the United States. The same people who use their skills and technology to murder millions of people, innocent people, to develop military technology for them. To me, it's the same as making the argument of, well, I didn't pull the trigger, I just made the gun. Or I didn't pull the trigger, I just handed the gun to them. All the while knowing that the intent was for the person to murder the other person. It, it, to me, it's the same shit. These scientists, they knew that their talents were being used for evil. And that's just a fact. And I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like we as a society have not benefited off of what they've produced. If we briefly focus on the medical side of what the Nazis have done, the US benefited greatly from medical research they conducted. The Nazis were able to conduct some very questionable experiments for the sake of science and medicine that was very hard to do because of, you know, pesky human rights limitations. These concentration camps gave the Nazis the opportunity to have forced test subjects where they could conduct experiments on 
altitude, freezing temperatures, twins, and countless other experiments just to see their impacts on the human body. And you know, just horrible, horrible experiments on innocent men, women, and children. And for the US, it didn't matter that the knowledge they uncovered was through nefarious means. The US wanted the research that was born from these Nazi experiments and well, they got it. And this is the end of my video. Thank you so much for watching. At first I wasn't gonna do a video on Operation Paperclip, but after asking a lot of people like, have you ever heard of Operation Paperclip? And so many people saying no, I was like, I have to do this video, I, I have to. So if you are one of those people who never heard of Operation Paperclip, well, now you have. All right guys, thanks for watching. Until next time, bye-bye.